we're back. And uh, I hope you guys all, in, all enjoyed that uh, dose of Kurt. Uh, it's always refreshing uh, and thought-provoking. And I think uh, he's given us a lot to, uh, to think about in this panel. We are we're truly honored uh, to uh, have a, a, a fantastic panel to discuss uh, security-related uh, issues in Asian architecture. And I'll introduce uh, my panelists, and, we, and then I will start to, uh, to ask them some questions to kick us off. And then I want to integrate the audience, so please uh, get ready with your questions. Um, and the only rules there are I'd like you to identify yourself and any affiliation that you have uh, when I introduce you. I've been asked to remind everybody that uh, who's online with us that uh, the Twitter information, if you want to follow the live Twitter feeds for this program, are at Southeast Asia DC, at Shoal Chair, that's S-C-H-O-L-L Chair, at C-S-I-S, -S, and the hashtag to track all of that is CS, hashtag C-S-I-S Live. Um, we, uh, we're kicking off here. It's 11 o'clock, and we have an hour uh, of discussion. Let me briefly introduce our panelists. Um, they are all uh, uh, strategic uh, thinkers uh, and all have uh, play a, a current or past role in directly making and implementing policy. And it's a, it's a real treat to, to be up here with them. Let me first introduce His Excellency uh, Win Kwok Kuong, who's the ambassador of Vietnam to the United States. He, was, uh, he pre presented his credentials to President uh, Obama in July of 2011. He's no stranger to the United States. He's, uh, he's worked on uh, multilateral issues uh, in his ministry. He came to this position at, from a, a position as deputy foreign minister uh, in Hanoi. Uh, he went to school here. Uh, he went to the Fletcher School uh, of Law and Diplomacy in Boston at Tufts. Um, and got his master's there. And he's also studied at the Maxwell School of uh, Public Administration at Syracuse and, and attended um, classes at Harvard. Um, he's a strategist, a great thinker, and he's coming off a, a real high uh, of the visit of his president, um, uh, President Song, to the United States, which was, by all accounts, uh, a great success. And, and in part, I should say, largely due to his leadership uh, and working with uh, American counterparts to make sure that visit was successful. Next to him is uh, Vikram Singh. He is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia at the Department of Defense. Um, Vikram's world uh, is, includes all of ASEAN, all of South Asia except for Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Timor-Leste, and the Pacific Islands. So he's a man that his uh, wife doesn't see much uh, because he's usually in a plane somewhere uh, over the Pacific uh, Ocean. Uh, he's been a great leader, uh, and I think Kurt mentioned earlier, a real innovator uh, with his team at the Pentagon. He's just coming back from a, a four-country trip uh, to Southeast Asia with Secretary Hagel, those same four countries that President Barack Obama will be visiting uh, in October and has done some really interesting work there, and we're gonna, we're gonna wanna tap into, into that set of issues. And finally, my colleague and our fearless leader here at the Asia team at uh, CSIS, Mike Green is Senior Vice President for Asia here and Japan Chair at CSIS. He's also Associate Professor at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, Mike had many positions uh, in the government, um, I think most notably, uh, senior director for Asia, where he ran basically the same shop on the inside, um, and so we all just pretend that we're in the NSC when we're here, and we, you know, sit around Mike's table and and try to devise things to to do. But uh, he's a great leader, and uh, and we're happy to have him. Gentlemen, I want to I want to kick off. I think Kurt uh, sort of threw down the gauntlet and described um, the importance of uh, strengthening. Uh, ASEAN institutions using the architecture that's been built uh, and uh, applying that to um, the way we think about security uh, in, in the Asia Pacific. So I, let me kick off with the first question. Last year, uh, President Obama visited Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia ahead of the East Asia Summit. Uh, this year, he's headed to uh, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and the Philippines. 
Uh, he'll attend the uh, APEC Leaders Summit in Brunei and the uh, East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Summit in Indonesia, and then he has bilateral uh, visits uh, to Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, let me turn to Vikram and start with you, Vikram. What, what does the administration hope to accomplish with the president's trip this year? What, what are the security signals that we can, we can watch for uh, when the president is, uh, is in the region? Well, um, Ernie, first of all, thank you very much for hosting this. And I can't, I have to echo uh, Kurt's comments that I, I think a few short years ago, we wouldn't have been able to always fill huge halls with people uh, thinking and working on and worrying about Southeast Asia. And uh, it's a real testament to CSIS and the work that you and your team have done that you can regularly bring us together for these kinds of forums and that you really see uh, thinking about Southeast Asia, regional architecture, the Asia Pacific writ large uh, developing into, into a, a, a focus, um, not just for this administration, but I think for <clears throat> our business community, I think for people of both parties, I think it's really a national, it is a national focus. And so it's a, it's a privilege to be with you. Um, as I think Kurt mentioned, the president's trip has not been announced. So I, um, I, you know, I, I think we are all looking forward to his uh, looking forward to being in the region, and hope that will come to pass. What I do know is that I was just there with Secretary Hagel, and uh, and you know, assuming all goes according to uh, according to plan, I think you'll be we'll we'll be hearing that uh, you know. A, a, at all of the, as you, as you see with us being engaged so comprehensively in Asian regional architecture, um, what you see is a layering of American messages, American interest, American commitment. And to just echo something that Kurt said, I think the, the key is that we think the United States, one, has a critical interest in the development of regional architecture in Asia, in the trajectory that takes so that it will increasingly be able to deal with even very difficult challenges, even very troubling, uh, you know, persistent, tough issues. Um, and we also have, uh, I believe, a very important role in ensuring that that and helping that architecture develop in a way that follows from um, ASEAN's values, ASEAN's centrality, and, and ASEAN, you know, sort of the, the, the uh, is, is, is really in and of the region. And you know, Kurt talked about that a little bit. He said that we, had a, we have an important role in linkages, and we have an important role in helping, real, helping Asia itself realize this vision. So um, we're spending a lot of time supporting our partners, showing that we're working closely with partners and allies, trying to innovate how we cooperate. And we see the emerging architecture in Asia as really the most fruitful area for a lot of these activities. This is where countries are coming together and doing things together that will increase confidence, be that exercises, be that going to these meetings, be that having policy discussions, be that engaging on, on, tough, uh, on tough issues um, with one another in a whole bunch of different configurations. So sometimes that is, uh, and you, the regional architecture itself reflects all these different configurations. So um, I think what, you, what you'll see is that this is about our commitment to the region, our commitment to the rebalance of focus, which again, you know, not away from things, but focusing heavily on Asia, recognizing the importance that Asia plays in our national security and in our future in the United States, and being sure that we're there at the table, involved, and taking, uh, helping to take Asia in the right direction, particularly when it comes to what those norms and values and processes are going to be for dealing with hard issues and ensuring that the Asia Pacific remains on a positive trajectory is an engine of growth, stability, and prosperity for us and the, the region and really the whole world. Uh, Mike, you, you want to add anything? Um, I don't disagree with um, Vikram's points. I think they're right. I think the administration's approach um, to the region, to Southeast Asia in particular, um, and to the ES has been right. The only thing I'd mention, uh, which Vikram, for obvious reasons, can't, is um, one of the complications for the president is going to be where Syria is um, a month from now. Um, he may end up uh, wishing uh, on the way uh, to Southeast Asia that he had hit Sy Syria um, without going to Congress initially and just done it. 
um, because if the process that the Russians have um, manufactured goes nowhere, which is very likely, and we're back to debate and possibly, um, uh, the, possibly the use of force, that is not the context you want to take into countries like Malaysia or Indonesia. I think that the governments in those countries are, ex and within places like the Organization of Islamic Conferences and so forth, are quietly extremely worried about what Assad is doing and chemical weapons. Yeah. But the publics in those countries will not understand, um, particularly given the muddled message that the, um, the US has given on Syria. So that's going to be a big complicating factor. Um, and having worked in the White House, I can tell you, you can go anywhere in the world, but when the White House press corps goes with you, the world's issues color the summit. And uh, you, you can't always make the summit about Asia um, when something in the other part of the world is capturing the White House press corps' attention. Um, I don't know what the administration will advance as a theme. One theme I hope they'll advance is Secretary Hagel's theme in his meeting with the Malaysian defense minister when he said uh, the U.S. doesn't expect um, our friends in Southeast Asia to make a choice between the U.S. and China. I thought that was, that was a very effective, well-delivered message, backed by, in the, in the case of Secretary Hagel's trip, an obvious U.S. commitment to standing by our friends and, and, our, and especially our allies in the region. I thought that that was well done. I hope that would be a theme for the president. Um, uh, you know, with APEC and EAS back to back, um, there may be an opportunity to take advantage of the, um, the new Chinese attitude towards TPP and to start um, uh, breaking down this idea that the region is, you know, poised for a clash between um, RCEP, an intra-regional agreement, and TPP, and, and, and building some themes uh, there as well. But Syria is going to make this all very, very complicated. That's a good point. A Ambassador Kong, can I turn to you? I mean, I think uh, I certainly have felt over the last two years that uh, Washington has started to view Vietnam as one of the most strategic thinking of the ASEAN countries and, and really depend on uh, or, or look forward to your advice and input. And, and you certainly, uh, Vietnam certainly has had to, has taken a careful view uh, and assessment of ASEAN and U.S.-China relations. Could you um, share some of your thoughts uh, from a Vietnamese perspective? Uh, first, uh, thank you, Ernie, for your uh, kind and very generous introduction. Uh, it's uh, really an honor for me to be here at uh, CSIS, and uh, I think that the, the, the topic we are discussing today, uh, I agree that it's uh, relevant and timely, given now the ta uh, uh, much of the focus uh, in town now is you know, on Syria. So I think that your conference today on uh, Asian uh, architecture is kind of uh, a re-rebalancing you know, uh, uh, effort. and. Uh, I would like to give high credits for CSS for this. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, back to the uh, question, your question. I think that uh, well, uh, I just want to start with the, uh, by recalling uh, 2010 when Vietnam was chair, uh, was host of ASEAN year, and the fifth uh, is EAS uh, uh, that the United States was formally admitted uh, to the EAS mechanism. Uh, in fact, that uh, Vietnam, together with a few other uh, ASEAN countries, was a strong, strong uh, proponent of, uh, the, for the joining of the U United States in, the, in EAS. Uh, and why we did so? I think that uh, at least two reasons. The first is that you know, it's a consistent uh, policy or strategy of ASEAN, uh, first to integrate among ASEAN countries, uh, uh, second, uh, reach out uh, to uh, other dialogue partners, uh, especially the major powers, including the United States and others. Uh, and reason number two uh, for me, to, I see that uh, with the re U.S. rebalancing, and uh, you, you reaffirm that the uh, U.S. Uh, is a resident uh, Pacific power, and you have the national interest uh, in peace, stability, and uh, development in the region. So by inviting the U.S. to join EAS, uh, we welcome and much expect uh, for U.S. Uh, contribution for peace, security, stability, development in the region. Let me uh, let me just explore with the, with the panel, and I'll uh, leave it open to whoever wants to to bite uh, on this if if anyone does. Um, 
I think the case has been made a little bit by all of you and certainly by Kurt that economic integration is a sort of a key factor for, it's a, a key factor in security. And you sort of, I think the, and what I'm hearing is uh, you have to lead with economic engagement uh, to, uh, to uh, have a, a solid foundation in Asia anyway for security. Uh, would you agree with that? And do, what do you think about sort of the, I think, Mike, you referenced the, sort of the, we do have a couple disconnects where um, our geostrategic footprint uh, or our, our scope, uh, the way we think about Asia, includes India and all of ASEAN and, and all of all the EAS members, 18 countries, but APEC is a little different footprint. It, it excludes India, three of the ASEAN countries, and it, it does include um, Mexico, Canada, and some of the uh, Latin America countries. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd ask you to, to start. How, how, should we, how should the President be thinking about this, and, and how should we think about it? Well, I've been of the view uh, for, for some time um, that um, the architecture in Asia is going to remain eclectic mm. and diverse because the um, regime types, the levels of development, the threat perception are also diverse. And I'm a realist, and I think that the institutions have to reflect, will always reflect, the underlying power dynamics or um, uh, values, and those are diverse in Asia. They're, 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 they're dynamic, they're changing, but they're diverse. So I think, personally, it's a mistake to try to rationalize um, the multilateral uh, energy in Asia into one so-called architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the U.S. should be pushing to, ha to have India in every, uh, uh, you know, architecture. I don't think we should be pushing to have all ASEAN, 10 ASEAN countries in TPP necessarily. I don't think we have to push to have Canada and Mexico and everything. We're going to feel our way along. Mm -hmm. And um, as the um, economic interdependence, um, as norms or how we view the role of institutional uh, uh, architecture in Asia emerges, we'll start docking and connecting. But I think it's a mistake to expend a huge amount of energy. Even ASEAN centrality, which I think is, is, is a benefit for U.S. interests and regional stability, does not really, it defines the ARF, it defines the EAS, it does not define the security order in Asia as a whole. So, um, so we have to be nimble enough to be prepared for quite eclectic architecture and, and dock these things and connect them when it makes sense, but not try to artificially, uh, artificially push it. Uh, just very briefly, I would say, Ernie, it's, you know, I think it's clear to those of us who watch the development of, of uh, the architecture in Asia, we, we recognize that it really was by focusing on areas where you could find consensus by using Americans sometimes are frustrated by a consensus based approach it doesn't get enough done. But if you look at the if you look at what it has achieved, what it's done is that it's enabled the building of trust, confidence, and the, also the stabilizing of a lot of these uh, uh, countries over the time, the dealing with problems that, it's such that the architecture is now taking on more uh, difficult security issues. So I'd really say that they're sort of mutually reinforcing. Um, if, no, if people didn't have a chance, I think Secretary Hagel addressed this quite well in a speech in Kuala Lumpur on this last trip, and really looking at how security is an underpinning at the end of the day. The focus, really, I think for all of the governments in the region, and for China, and for the United States, is, is largely economic, social, and in those, in those areas. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's about keeping a good thing going. And uh, if you uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, architectures uh, uh, in uh, East Asia, or in, uh, South, uh, in, in East Asia, you see that uh, there are many, you know, from APEC, you, on economic uh, terms, you are discussing about the RCEP, about the EE, uh, three E's. On the uh, security side, you have the ARF, the ADMM Plus, uh, the East Asia Summit, as, uh, um, and, and so on. So I think that uh, I agree with you that it's uh, dynamic, it's uh, diverse, but uh, it's evolving. So uh, one of the most important tasks for, for, for EAS uh, that uh, President Obama is going to attend is that to, uh, to help, uh, is, uh, to help uh, develop regional uh, norms and frameworks. And, uh, and I think that um, U.S. In, in this area, 
the U.S., as you mentioned, supports the centrality role of ASEAN, and we appreciate that. And I think that we 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 should we encourage the U.S. The, uh, the same that to respect ASEAN uh, centrality role and also uh, have uh, uh, also uh, uh, m m already active but much more active role in in in, in helping you know. Uh, uh, develop the uh, regional norms and uh, and frameworks. One of the themes that's evolved in this discussion is, and I think Mike, you, you might have been referring to it, is as you develop frameworks, even overlapping frameworks that mm -hmm. reinforce, as, as uh, Vikram said, uh, sort of a, a key ante to be actually be at the table is deep or uh, you know very granular relationships with the individual players, with the key countries. Uh, in so that you have a, a, a strong foundational bilateral relationship which you can use to um, sort of empower uh, regional relationships. In that context, Ambassador, I wanted to, to call on you and then I invite the other uh, two panelists to, to comment on, on other countries or, or on the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. But in July, we, we inked the uh, U.S.-Vietnam Comprehensive Partnership Agreement and it, that created a high-level dialogue between the Secretary of State and, and your foreign minister. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this progressing? Are we, are we at the right level with the U.S. and Vietnam, or is it moving at a pace that you're comfortable with? And uh, do you have advice from what you've experienced in Vietnam for us or for other countries? Uh, so I guess the, my question is, um, based on the U.S.-Vietnam Comprehensive Partnership, uh, do you think we have uh, U.S. Vietnam relationship is uh, in good shape? Uh, should we have more ambition? Mm -hmm. And do you have any advice based on your experience in creating, crafting that relationship for either the United States or other Asian countries? Uh, uh, as you mentioned in July, the President of Vietnam visited the United States and had a very productive uh, uh, meeting with President Obama, and they announced the formation of a new framework of partnership between the United States and, and, and Vietnam. That's the comprehensive partnership. If you look back at the history of relationship between Vietnam and the United States, you see that uh, and uh, uh, it was also interesting to recall that when uh, President uh, Chung Tung Sang met with uh, President Obama, uh, he uh, handed, uh, he gave a copy of uh, our uh, President Ho Chi Minh's letter to President Henry Truman in, uh, in uh, 1946, uh, expressing Vietnam's desire for have the full cooperation with the United States. And it took Vietnam and the United States 68 years to realize that when we, we formed the comprehensive partnership. And uh, in that, we identified for the first time the principles guiding bilateral relations between Vietnam and the United States. And we also identified, as a remember, about nine areas of cooperation in the bilateral uh, uh, comprehensive par partnership. So I think that's a great achievement, and it's a historical uh, milestone, historic milestone in our bilateral relationships. We should continue building on that, you know, uh, on that basis and you know, on foundation. And I can see and believe that uh, U.S. and Vietnam relations in the years to come we further further developed in that direction. And it's very interesting, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to, to let you know that uh, uh, oh, there is question, you know, uh, even asked by a very senior uh, U.S. administration here, that is, the US, uh, is Vietnam really, you know, uh, just thinking about the visit itself, but about well, not, not much about their deliverables. But my answer is that just uh, look uh, no, uh, look at uh, let the facts. And uh, after the visit, uh, we see quite a few other, de uh, few uh, others developments, uh, positive developments, and we see more more positive developments. The president himself, the president of Vietnam himself, called me several times for the follow-ups. So we are really committed to what we been, uh, we have agreed uh, with the United States, and what the two presidents have agreed with one another, and we. We are serious about commitments. Any comments? I just, in, on the defense side, Ernie, just, I think that the comprehensive partnership 
reinforces what we've begun on the defense side. It's only in 2011 that we first signed a memorandum of understanding on defense cooperation between the United States and Vietnam. We have five focus areas, and I think um, you know, Ambassador Kong has been an incredibly strategic and thoughtful partner, and we have made uh, you know we're really we're really moving towards transformation of this relationship. And also, I think uh, things like Vietnam's leadership role in uh, really the establishment of the ADMM Plus uh, is is sort of a testament to the fact that working with Vietnam has been just very productive in terms of um, how countries in the region are working together. You want to you want to follow? Just on the uh, in, uh, on the defense side, first uh, thank you, Vikram Singh, uh, for for reminding us that about the uh, our initiative to uh, to launch the. Uh, uh, ADM Plus and the uh, inu inaugural meeting was in Vietnam in 2010. Uh, first, it was attended three years. Uh, uh, once in every three year, now it's uh, decided because of the productivity of the ADMM Plus uh, mechanism. Now we decided that would be uh, uh, once in every two years. And uh, uh, so, uh, for me as a career diplomat, uh, I strongly support the defense diplomacy. Uh, I'd rather see you know, defense uh, military men uh, from different countries in the region sitting, talking diplomacy with one another, than uh, engaging in diplomacy rather than they are engaging in battlefields. So I strongly support the ADM Plus, and I think that we should continue on that. Um, let me turn to Mike to comment on this. You do a lot of work on alliances because you're the U.S.-Japan alliance is a, is a rock uh, in our engagement in Asia. It, how do you see alliances within the, these the discussion of architecture, and how do we um, can we use the ADMM plus and joint exercises to actually strengthen alliances? I mean, are they mutually reinforcing, or do they or do they sort of diminish and compete? For most of American um, foreign policy history in Asia after the war. Um, alliances and multilateralism were viewed as um, mutually exclusive, and James Baker wrote a famous um, piece in Foreign Affairs um, around 1991 um, where he described the hub and spokes of American bilateral alliances, and he was trying to, you know, s suppress the enthusiasm about, um, a lot of it from Mahathir, but the enthusiasm about multilateralism, which had been seen as a Soviet ploy to break up our alliances. Um, that's just not the case anymore. I think anybody who looks at alliances sees the multilateral architecture, especially ADMM plus, as um, reinforcing, mutually reinforcing. And when Secretary Hagel goes to Japan and Korea at the end of the month, I hope that in the joint statement we're going to do with Japan and with Korea, he emphasizes this, mm -hmm. that for the U.S.-Japan alliance and the U.S.-Korea alliance, ADMM plus is, is, is great. And these alliances bring into ADMM plus um, levels of interoperability and logistical support that make them a lot more effective. So um, we're way past where we were, you know, two decades ago on this question, and uh, it, I think it's 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 win-win. Great. That's terrific. I'm going to open up the floor because uh, we've got a lot of talent out in this audience, and, and I'd love to engage uh, you with your questions. Let's start here. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Uh, we've been talking a lot about goals. I'm Ellen Frost from the East-West Center National Defense University. We've been talking a lot about goals, and I want to raise the thorny subject of obstacles. Um, Vikram Singh, to what extent do um, budget cuts, sequestration, uh, restrictions on travel, uh, congressional polarization, et cetera, hamper the specific projects and goals that you and Kurt have laid out? And Ambassador Kwong, um, does the combination of those obstacles plus Syria uh, seriously hamper um, in, in Vietnam and perhaps elsewhere in ASEAN, um, the, the uh, appreciation of the U.S. security commitment, or have our domestic troubles seriously undermined our security credibility in the region? Thank you. Uh, if I just start, I think, look, the, 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 the challenges of sequestration, budget challenges, what we're facing, it's really forced uh, you know, us to take a hard look at, at everything. 
what we've, uh, and, and as you know, the Secretary did that through a strategic choices management review. We have a quadrennial defense review coming up. And uh, it, would be, it would be very nice to actually have a clear picture of where we're going. And it would be very nice to have uh, budget impasses not be the norm, but be the exception, and uh, be able to really think strategically about how we move forward. But the, you know, but where we are, what we do know is we're able to meet the commitments that we've decided to meet. And I think Secretary Hagel was able to deliver a very clear, very confident message to counterparts across Asia that what we've established as the rebalance, what we feel we need to do to be at the table and to be invested in the region are all things we're going to be able to do um, no matter how things play out uh, on, the, on the budget front. So we're, we, feel, we feel very comfortable. It's not... Um, you know, fortunately for us, this investing in the region is more about time, energy, um, exercises, doing things together. It is not involving, uh, you know, vast, uh, vast investments that would be really jeopardized. So it's it's tough. It's a it's a it's a it's a tough time, but we're not worried about being able to make the rebalance real. And uh, for me, uh, uh, first. Uh uh, it's uh, you have to acknowledge that there was uh, there is a concern about the uh, about the sustainability sustainability of the U.S. rebalancing in the region, given the fact now of Syria, Middle East, and so on. But uh, uh, if you look in the uh, in the uh, in the longer term, I think that uh, uh, I agree uh, with uh, what Vikram Singh just mentioned that the uh, rebalancing is there to stay. Uh, because, why? It's not because of ASEAN or because weak countries in the region are good enough to persuade the U.S. to remain in the U.S. But it is the in interest of the United States to remain engaged and committed to the region, the most dynamic region in the world now. And uh, by that, uh, I think that uh, now that's the, uh, the, the first. The second, look at the facts. I think that uh, the, mm, the Secretary of uh, Secretary Kerry just been to mission uh, to to the region. Secretary Hager, uh, Secretary Hager just been there, and uh, we expect the United, uh, U.S. president will be in the region again. So we think that the U.S. Uh, re rebalancing is there, and uh, uh, we are comfortable with that. Uh, and uh, uh, I just want to uh, to 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 quote our president Chung uh, uh, Sang when he he was here in at CSAS. Uh, 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 on July the fifth, uh, 25th, that uh, we, uh, uh, in which he said, unquote, we welcome President Obama's commitment to enhance cooperation in Asia-Pacific for peace, stability, and cooperation. And the United States view ASEAN as a central pillar of this policy and supports ASEAN centrality in the original architecture. The U.S. also voices support for peace, stability, security, and maritime security and safety in the Eastern Sea. Uh, apart from TPP, so we accelerate co we, we Vietnam we accelerate cooperation with the U.S. at various forums, including you know ASEAN-led mechanisms, the LMI, uh, the East Asia Summit, and APEC, and so on. So uh, we believe uh, rebalancing is needed and it's real. Mike, you didn't ask me, but can I? <laughs> um, we did a study, as, as you know, Ellen at CSIS certainly helped us a lot. Um, at the request of uh, the Congress and DOD on the force posture strategy in Asia. Um, drawing from that research, um, I, I think the pivot is about Asia broadly. And from, I would argue, from the security perspective, the integrity of the first island chain that runs from Japan through the Philippines, the East and South China Sea, is really the front line of where we want stability and reassurance and, if necessary, deterrence. <clears throat> so in that sense, it's unified. But the Southeast Asian and North Asian views of sequestration and the implications are very different. In Southeast Asia, it's mostly about what the, you know, the jargon is shaping the environment, about peacetime engagement, building capacity, helping shore up states that are vulnerable, building cooperation. And the Pentagon is getting, I think, an A plus for that. Uh, and this happens to be Vikram's part of Asia. So I'm not just saying this to be nice to him, but Secretary Hagel's really been uh, 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 putting his money where his mouth is. It, you know, exercise budgets in the middle of a sequestration are actually going up uh, for that part of the world. The, the heavy lift, in a way, though, um, be is in North Asia, where we're not just talking about 
so-called shaping or peacetime engagement and conflict building, these are militaries and governments, Korea and Japan, that care and a lot about our capability to do the kinetic part, the war fighting part of our um, forward presence and commitments. And their sequestration, I think, quietly has people quite nervous because if you're talking about the difference between 10 aircraft carriers and seven aircraft carriers, or whether or not we can maintain you know, ground forces on the Korean Peninsula, that's a very, very big deal. And no one knows where all this is going. So there's nothing really to react to. But that's a, it's, a, it's a different issue between Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. And I think we're doing very well in Southeast Asia. I think Northeast Asia is going to be uh, challenging. Great. The gentleman here. Hi. <coughs> Hello. <coughs> uh, Susumu uh, Awanohara from Medley Advisors. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, framework and process, but I thought we, we were going to hear about issues. Uh, that, and uh, my question is, I mean, how, does, uh, how do these institutions that you talk about uh, help tackle issues, uh, say, like the, the South China Sea issues? Um, do, do they, do, uh, are the countries all agreed that, that these institutions will take up these issues or are some countries against a uh, multilateral approach to these issues? That's a great question. And uh, Ambassador, maybe you could yeah. start us off. <laughs> yes. Uh, I agree with you. That's a great question. <laughs> so not only talking about the process and the objectives and goals, but about the issues. So I think that uh, the, uh, especially the AES, com forthcoming AES, uh, we should uh, and the AES members, uh, countries, should, uh, uh, should address the, uh, uh, the current challenges of, uh, of the day. And in that uh, uh, sense, I mean that there are uh, traditional uh, uh, security issues, as, such as the proliferation issues, the territory disputes, and also the non-traditional security issues, such as the uh, natural disaster, uh, climate change, environmental degradation, food security, and world security. Uh, I think the U.S. should strengthen cooperation and co response to those challenges. And in this regard, I, I understand that uh, there's discussions on the way that, uh, and there will be uh, the convening of the inaugural Asia-Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance uh, to be co-chaired by the Prime Ministers of Australia and Vietnam on the sidelines of the 8th uh, EAS. And we also support uh, Australia's uh, proposal on the establishment of an EAS Connectivity Forum uh, to support the implementation of the Bali Declaration on Connectivity. And we also welcome the uh, Bunai's proposal for an EAS Declaration on Food Security. On the uh, maritime uh, security and safety issues, uh, I think that the AS should continue to cooperate on the search and rescue, combating piracy, uh, boosting uh, maritime connectivity, and uh, protecting uh, the ocean's bio biodiversity and sustainable uh, management of seafood resources. Uh, in view of the uh, uh, issues you mentioned about the East China Sea or South China Sea, which we call the Eastern Sea, and the AS should further uphold its role in promoting um, dialogue, cooperation, and confidence building, and to work ensure, to ensure peace, stability, maritime security and safety, and freedom of navigation, uh, exercise of self-restraint, uh, self non-use of force, peaceful settlement, of the disputes on the basis of respect of international law, uh, including the unclosed uh, 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 1982, and to support uh, uh, efforts by ASEAN and China in the effective uh, implementation of the DOC and uh, towards an early conclusion of the COC uh, on the, uh, on the, cell, uh, in the in the South China Sea. Let me uh, thank you, Ambassador. Let me follow up and, and see if I can pull Victor or, or Vikram and uh, Mike into this. Um, isn't it? I mean, isn't one of the sort of the broad objectives of this architecture, the the EAS uh, in particular, and ADMM, and sort of if you if you're thinking about strategic trust building, 
isn't the sort of the goal addressing issues like the East Sea and the Senkakus and Dayus and the, and the South China Sea, isn't the goal to try to get everybody to the table, get everybody to, to ante up or have equity, and then play, make the rules together and then play by those rules? I mean, in, that's not going to happen overnight, but isn't that sort of why we're, we're in from a security point of view? Um, over the long haul, um, the problem is that some of the key players, in particular China, don't think these forums should be making rules. Um, and uh, we did, as actually, as before you came, Ernie, but you, you, you know about this, we did a survey here at CSIS of elites across the Asian region about how they saw the role of these institutions. And there were, um, everyone agreed with East Asia community building, but there were clear divisions on the question of whether um, these institutions should make rules, particularly if the rules um, are, uh, go beyond the border. Um, and uh, I don't think that's been resolved uh, at all. Uh, the survey also showed when we asked the hypothetical question um, 10 years from now, not today, but 10 years from now, if this architecture building continues, what institutions would you turn to or what should your government turn to if there's a crisis? And we had a bunch of crises, pandemics, uh, security crisis, proliferation. Nobody chose EAS, ARF. Nobody chose them. And I don't think anyone in the region views these yet or even in the next five to 10 years as being um, uh, collective security crisis management institutions. <clears throat> um, that doesn't mean they don't have value, but it gives you some perspective. We're doing the survey again this year, by the way, and should have the results out January timeframe. Yeah, interesting to see if there's change. Um, it, so we have to be realistic about the expectations. I, I, I worked on ARF when I was in the White House, and it was like watching paint dry. I mean, it was so, sorry, Ambassador, but as you know, it was not very exciting. ARF is exciting now. Yeah. Um, not because it's the Treaty of Versailles and we're coming up with, you know, collective conclusions to problems, but because there's a real competition for influence. And that's actually a good thing in an ironic way, because I think ARF has the ability um, to impose what I would call a kind of influence cost. So if China pushes too hard, what will happen is within the ARF there will be more support, and there is more support, mm -hmm. this year more than last, um, for supporting a code of conduct and having some basic, very, very basic rules that you don't use coercion, that you that China should talk to, that ASEAN centrality matters. So it does have a dampening effect on friction that's very positive, but that's precisely because there's a competition for influence. If Beijing and Washington and other countries didn't care what ASEAN thought, we wouldn't care. We would, we would you know, we do what we did in the late 90s with the financial crisis. We learned a big lesson when you don't listen to what ASEAN thinks. And now the Chinese are learning that lesson. So in terms of imposing a kind of cost, because we both want influence, it's actually quite healthy, yeah. I think. But it's not a problem-solving uh, uh, institution. Okay. I think one very quick side comment that's a supporting comment. What, it, what, the, what we know these institutions can do is increase, um, is really increase interaction. And so for, on the defense side, for example, um, you know, the diplomatic piece of this, some of these some of these tensions are very much bilateral, some are very much multilateral, and they're going to probably be resolved in a, in a variety of different ways. And at some point, this reg the regional architecture might play a big role. It might not. And the, a lot of these things will take a, lo uh, take a long time. But in the meantime, um, there's things like reducing risk and building confidence. And those things can very much happen through these kinds of structures. So when we do multilateral exercises at sea, and it includes not only all 10 ASEAN countries, but it also pulls in the uh, plus countries in the ADMM, including the United States, China, uh, and others, that's a, that, that does make a real difference because that helps us see how our how are guys out there that might be sort of in the midst of what could become a conflict, how are they going to behave? How are they going to learn how to behave? And I, we, we really welcome this year um, ADMM in, uh, in Brunei. The declaration included something new, which was uh, language on taking concrete measures to uh, take steps to avoid disputes escalating at sea and things like that. And that is, and I think that will support more uh, practicing and exercising of, uh, of things that can at least reduce risk, because I think everyone acknowledges that these are tough problems. So I, I think I agree with Mike and Vikram about the, uh, no, uh, the, uh, the role of EAS. Uh, uh, I agree that it's not a problem-solving institution, and uh, uh, EAS continue, uh, has been and, and we continue to be a leaders-led uh, forum. 
uh, to to address the issues. Uh, and uh, no, uh, the more the uh, and agree with Mr. Senior about the in increasing of the interactions, and it would help you know, to great you know, the environment for countries uh, to to solve their own problems, but it's not like a, a problem-solving institution itself. Uh, Dr. Ott. Uh, thanks. Uh, Marvin Ott, Johns Hopkins, Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, this is sort of a follow-on, I think. Uh, Peter Lavoy, Assistant Secretary in this hall just a few days ago, speak Okay, sorry. Anyway, there's an interesting reference in the course of that conversation about preferences within the region in terms of China and the U.S. valuing assurances that the U.S. is not asking the region to choose. But within the region, there was a preference to deal with China and the U.S. separately. And, and I'm not quite sure the implications of that, and it just struck me as an interesting, it was an observation, nothing more than that. But I wonder if there would be comments on the panel of whether you see that in the region, whether there's any trend lines, is there any dynamic, any change going on, and what the, what the sort of root of that preference is. Well, I mean, ASEAN wants to be in the, is it the catbird seat? I actually never knew what a catbird seat was, but <laughs> they want to be in the, um, uh, they want to be the center of this uh, process. And if the U.S. and China reach some grand condominium and start deciding how issues will be resolved, then ASEAN influence will collapse very quickly. But I don't think our friends in Southeast Asia or Japan or Australia or India have to worry too much about a U.S.-China condominium. <clears throat> um, I think it would be a good idea if we had some understanding from our friends in the region, if the U.S. and China could actually pick some projects to work together on. We, uh, Ernie and I have said maybe the U.S. and China could do more together on Myanmar, on Burma's uh, development. Uh, not on democracy, we won't agree on that, but, but on the economic development. Or, uh, some areas to show that we're not in a zero-sum competition in Southeast Asia. That would be useful and maybe we'd find some understanding. I don't think a condominium is going to happen, but that's, uh, but that's a bad case scenario for anybody in Asia who's not the U.S. or China. Uh. Uh, for countries in the region, uh, first, we don't want to see a confrontation between China and the United States. It's in mm, no interest of any countries in the region to see such a confrontation between China and the U.S. And I agree with Kurt that uh, we also uh, want to see a good relationship between U.S. and China, a cooperation between U.S. and China. And U.S. and China can cooperate to contribute to peace and stability and uh, development, prosperity in the region is good for all countries in the region. But I agree with you that, you know, I don't, I don't think that countries in the region want to see a condominium, you know, big powers deciding and the fate of uh, smaller countries. So, I, I, frank, very frankly speaking, you don't want to see it. So that's why ASEAN, we uphold to the centrality role of ASEAN in, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, institution building efforts and in also in the architecture, in the regional architecture. So ASEAN always want to, 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 to uphold its centrality role. Okay, it's time for one more question. The gentleman here, the, the gray suit. Hi, I'm Mike Beserve, formerly of the State Department and U.S. Army Pacific. I'd like to ask about one particular security issue that uh, faces uh, the new architecture in Southeast Asia, and that's U.S. military exercises and mill-mill contacts. Aside, uh, Mr. Singh referred to RIMPAC and the multilateral exercises. Aside from Cobra Gold and I think the PACPAMs or the Pacific Army Management Seminar, almost all of our relations, military to military in, in Asia now, are bilateral. It's still a spoken wheel whether it's Yamasakura in Japan, or Balakatan, or Talos Gold, Keras Strike, they're all U.S. military to U.S. military. How do you see this developing over time, over the next 10 years or so? Are we going to integrate China? Uh, does the EAS need a security component? And should our 
budget for military exercises be re-pivoted or pivot towards Southeast Asia, taking away the enormous amount of money that goes to Japan and Northeast Asia, Ultra Focus uh, Guardian and uh, Yamasakura, and moving that south perhaps to multilateral exercises that will engage all of Southeast Asia. I think um, Mike, Mike just mentioned he's, we've done a, a study that he led on this, so I think I'll let him start, and then Vikram, you can you can bat clean up on this one if, if you if you would. Um, I don't know if this is what you're thinking, Mike, but but I'm a little worried in sort of reading the tea leaves that big army uh, and other parts of the Pentagon are thinking to continue um, supporting this very successful engagement in Southeast Asia. They may do less in North Asia, where we've historically done so much. I think that would be an enormous mistake for the reason I mentioned earlier, because um, the stakes are, are, I don't want, the stakes are higher. I mean, there's more, we're talking about um, uh, war and peace uh, in North Asia in a, in a way we aren't quite in Southeast Asia. Um, and I, I would hope that we don't rob Northeast Asia to, to continue the very successful engagement in, in Southeast Asia. The, I, the, the best um, uh, pattern would be um, if we have very high-end bilateral exercises and we should pushing them, be pushing them on missile defense and other things higher with Japan, Korea, Australia, our sort of NATO level high-end militaries in terms of their technical capabilities. We should be um, multilateralizing those more. We, we do, you know, the Malabar with the Indians now includes Japan in most years. Uh, we, I, I'm sure the Pentagon wants to do more US, Japan, Korea. They're political issues, but those are on again, off again. Um, and the Marine Corps is definitely gonna be doing more um, amphibious exercises off of Guam with the countries that want Marine Corps, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, um, New Zealand. And then there should be another level where we're really multilateralizing, which gets at all the things Vikram said, confidence building. And here, I think the story is quite good. ADMM Plus has done more military exercises in this year alone than the ARF has done in its entire history. Um, and ADMM Plus came out of nowhere. Um, and it's a real opportunity to, to, to do what you're talking about, to broadly multilateralize exercises so we can incorporate China, build some rules of the road. But you're going to have different levels of exercises, and we need to maintain the high-end ones um, for stability. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a great question, and and Mike, thank you also for your answer. I, I just let me address something really head-on. Uh, you know, we are absolutely rock solid, steadfast in our commitments to our core treaty allies in the region, Japan and Korea. Uh, are the are the bedrock of the security architecture that has supported peace and stability that has dealt with what is a very real challenge for example from North Korea this is um, and I, I don't think there should be any uh, any doubt uh, that the United States will continue to work extremely well and closely and devote the necessary resources to the posture in those countries to working together and to the bilateral exercises and things we need to do to make sure that those alliances are strong and capable of dealing with anything they may have to deal with. Um, that, that said, it is, it is, we are looking at the hub and spoke model of old in a very new context. And it is entirely appropriate and necessary that we, that we uh, actually start to focus on doing more with more partners, networking more partners together in support of common interests. And so I think what you will see is a continuation and a commitment to our bilateral engagements and what we do with, with our allies and closest partners bilaterally. You will see some of those bilateral things sometimes on an on again, off again, and sometimes more systematically multilateralizing drawing in more partners. If you think about things like Cobra Gold, they have, got, they have grown and grown and grown and increased more, and that's because it's something that we and our Thai partners see as a, as a good thing to do. Um, there will be exercises that we choose to keep bilateral. And I think you're going to see a really significant commitment on our, on our part to more multilateral exercises like those that are hosted by ASEAN. So I think a multilateralization is, uh, is afoot, and I think it's exactly what we want to see. We, we see great value in those. I think the, you know, Brunei hosted an HADR Milmed exercise as one of these, uh, one of the ADMM exercises. 
uh, 18 countries, some 3,000 military personnel from 18 countries, including us, including China. Um, you know, a great, we had uh, U.S. officers on the Chinese uh, hospital ship, the Peace Ark, um, every day of that exercise. I mean, these are, these are opportunities that you, you really can't, um, can't overestimate how important it is that these kinds of activities are happening. And it's a very hopeful thing that these kinds of things, are, these activities are happening in the region. So I think you'll see us doing more multilateral stuff. I do not think it will come at the expense of our core alliances. Well, let me, uh, let me just announce, we are going to wrap up the session. I'm going to ask you all to join me in thanking the speakers in a second. Uh, hang on. <laughs> but before I do that, I just want to remind everybody who's watching online, we're going to break for lunch now. Uh, you have 15 minutes to go and, and get lunch. It's in the back or in the in the room back here. The, our team will uh, will show you where that is. Get lunch. We're going to come back. Keynote speech by Scott Marcel, who's the principal deputy assistant secretary in the East Asia Pacific Division of State, uh, and a great discussion on economic and business issues this afternoon. So please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Thank you.